In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. The media likes to say that in 2017, I believe, that Uber hit the crisis, that everything, you know, it was one thing after the other with Uber, with Uber, with Uber. But the reality was that they had a cultural crisis and culture is led from the top down and then supported bottom up. And they, their culture, their crisis was their founding CEO. They had that for years. In 2017, it just all, all of the corrosion just finally erupted. I'm Aga Bayer. And this is the Culture Lab podcast, where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers. And together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 52. I am so excited to be back with this new season of Culture Lab. We took a break, you might have noticed, we haven't released an episode for a while. And the reason for that is that we realized that the Culture Lab team is a human team and humans need a break from time to time. We need a break to recharge, rejuvenate and come back with new ideas. And this is exactly what happened. So we're back with a new season, amazing guests, amazing new ideas, not just for the podcast, but for our business. So what I would say is if you haven't had a long break for a while, really, really take one. It's going to make wonders to your levels of creativity and productivity. Highly, highly recommend it. And I'm also super glad that I had a chat with our guest today. Her name is Melissa Agnes and her area of expertise is something that most of us don't really enjoy thinking about. So the thing is, what would happen if things went off the rails and if we found our business in a major crisis situation? And there are so many questions that we could ask about this, like, are we ready for it? Do we have what it takes to handle it well? Can our brand and our reputation survive it? And most importantly, is there a way to prevent it? Is there a way to prevent what's preventable? And especially after a recent crop of scandals, including Uber, Volkswagen, Wells Fargo, and the most recent one with Boeing and lives being lost, companies and boards have definitely started focusing on culture more. They realize that it's important to understand culture and know how to shape it so that you can reduce risk. And if you're thinking, oh, I don't really think that this is relevant for me, think again. Companies went down, but also careers have been destroyed because human nature is simply to underestimate risk. There is even a name for it in psychology and in behavioral economics. It's called optimism bias. It's a cognitive bias that causes us to believe that we are less likely to experience a negative event than someone else. And optimism bias is super common and it transcends gender, ethnicity, nationality and age. And by the way, I know that it's not entirely relevant, but I find this fascinating. Optimism biases have even been reported in rats and birds. So think about it. We're not alone. Um, But back to our guest, Melissa is a leading authority on crisis readiness, reputation management, and brand protection. And she is super smart, very engaging, and has a very impressive bio. Check it out in the show notes. And you'll hear us talk about how she became so obsessed with risk, what her entrepreneurial journey has been like, and how she found her calling. Also, She talks about what it means to be crisis ready and what's the difference between a crisis and an issue and how to identify preventable crisis and act when you are faced with something that you simply couldn't predict. So here we go. Here is Melissa Agnes.
So, Melissa, welcome to Culture Lab. Thank you for having me, Aga. I'm happy to be here. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to speak to you because you um, inhabit a space that I find very interesting. So I can't wait to dive and delve into it. But before we go there, could you briefly introduce yourself to our listeners? Absolutely. My name is Melissa Agnes. I specialize in crisis readiness. So at a very intriguing high level, I help organizations build brand invincibility by ensuring that they have a culture. So speaks to you um, and your audience. Make sure they have a culture that intrinsically understands and knows precisely what to do in the case of any negative event so that you always come out of it, not with not just with the incident managed, but with increased brand equity. So raising the levels of trust, credibility, and goodwill in the organization in its brand. That, that sounds really intriguing. And so I'm sure that a lot of our nis- listeners are thinking now, oh, that's that. Yeah, I want to learn more about that. Um, but before we talk about your area of expertise, I'm curious to understand what, what were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? In other words, what made Melissa, Melissa? Oh, so many things made Melissa, Melissa. Um, but I mean, I think it goes for everything, right? It's the environment in which you're raised, right? you're nurtured, you're raised, you're, you're, you have a lack of nurture. Um, yeah, I, the way, so the crisis readiness, people always ask me, how do I get into it? I got into it kind of organically, but it's really, truly, it's the way that my brain works. And that is probably shaped by my childhood. So what was your childhood like? Um, <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> uh, no, just, you know, um, managing crisis in my home was a, was a daily, well, not a daily thing. I don't want to be overly dramatic. It was a very prevalent thing. Um, and coming out of it in ways where you would be better off tomorrow, not just today, um, goes, speaks to, you know, coming out of things with increased, um, trust and credibility. And so, yeah, that's kind of the pattern that it took. It was just a very scattered childhood, we'll say. So I, I understand that you might not want to um, reveal too many details about what the challenges were for you as a child, but I'm curious whether the situations that you had to face as a child in your family were the kind of situations that um, made you feel like, oh, I'm responsible here to um, solve these problems and help our family to function in a healthier way. Um, so can you, can you just give us a little yeah, bit more? Yeah, absolutely. On- I, I think that I'm that person though. I think that, you know, track record has proven that, or my own track record, right? Collecting my data um, from my past is that is if I, I feel that we all, if we have a capability of doing something that is, you know, for the greater good, whether that's for the greater good of a household or for a human or for the world and society at large, doesn't matter, then we have that responsibility to do that. And I'm pretty sure that I felt that I had that responsibility. I had the capacity Mm. and therefore took on the responsibility from a young age um, within my own environments. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And I think it's an experience that a lot of people have had in their childhood. Sure. Not everyone, Absolutely. but but definitely a lot of people as children felt like they were responsible to support the families to go through those small crises. Um, so um, it's, it's interesting how then you kind of find the same path or the same challenges in your professional life. Um, you said that a lot of people ask you how you got into it. So I think one one thing definitely um, that is clear is your childhood. But then I'm curious, so when you grew up and when you started your professional career, was it immediately in this area or there was oh, some, no, no. <laughs> No. Um, okay. So I was, uh, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 21. I learned early on that I wasn't made for corporate life. Um, and when I started, I did photo montages for senior people where I lost more money on every sale than I made. <laughs> so it's quite embarrassing. Um, but it also led me to where I am today. So from there, my partner and I at the time, uh, morphed that into that turned into kind of just organically turned into web design and social media brand marketing. And right at the time where social media was becoming a thing. And I remember there was one morning I was just kind of doing my morning readings and it just struck me. There was this aha light bulb moment where I could see all of the risks, all the risks with social, all of the risks with just technology at large and the way that society um, was shaping, right? With real-time communication and 
real time media and um, two way communication and heightened expectations were starting to form in organizations as a result of social media and these platforms. And because I see risk everywhere, it's the way that my brain works, I could immediately see the risks and I could immediately see that the risks were easy to mitigate if people started talking about them, but research after research proved to me that nobody was talking about them and I didn't understand that. And then I also could see that if we get to that point of risk mitigation, which is easy, um, then we're presented as organizations with so much unprecedented opportunity for difficult situations and that serves the greater good, that serves the people that an organization is built and designed and responsible to serving. Um, so I spent about a year because it kind of just fed the wiring of my makings. I spent a year just devouring everything that I could on the subject of crisis management, because before that moment in time, I didn't actually know that it was a thing. And I, the more I researched, the more I learned, um, the more I realized that not even the longstanding professionals at the time in this field were talking about, it was like everybody was too scared or in denial or something. And I felt that that was a dis, it did a disservice to professionals and to organizations and to consumers. Um, so I started, I remember, well, actually before that, I remember saying to my partner, there's something here, there's something here. I just don't know precisely what it is yet. And about a year into my, you know, quote unquote studies, we had just launched the website for one of our clients, which was a real estate investment trust. So a public company that invests in real estate and their primary um, stakeholder are their investors. And the VP had called me really early one morning saying, our president's in the car with a prospective investor. The radio is reporting that one of our buildings is about to explode. It's not true. Our investors are calling in off the hook. Apparently, the rumor started on Twitter. We have no idea what Twitter is, but we heard it's a digital thing. And since we just lost our, launched our website, we're hoping you can help us. <laughs> wow. So within a half an hour, we had I had the media correcting themselves. I had um, the information that investors needed going to investors because they weren't on Twitter, and that's where it was channeling. Um, long story short, the next day, the president of the company called and said, not only did our unit price, which is their stock price, go down yesterday, but it actually went up a cent. So thank you so much. Mm. And that was my, oh my goodness, I can serve. This is so important. This is so powerful. Mm. And this is so meaningful. And so we switched gears and I was young. I didn't have any marketing budget. I had no idea how to enter this space. So I decided I have a lot to say. I have a lot of questions that I feel that people, professionals should be, are responsible for asking themselves and answer, answering. And I don't seem to be finding that they're asking the questions. So I started a blog and I dedicated myself to blogging five days a week for several years. And the rest kind of just built from there. Wow. This is so fascinating. I think the first thing that I find fascinating is how the universe works, because you've been, as you say, you've been preparing for this for a year and then eventually an opportunity presents itself. You get this call and you have an opportunity to put what you have been studying into practice. And then you realize, yes, there's something here. Indeed, I was right. And, and you manage to serve, as you say, and you find a way to serve companies. Um, so I, I just love that. And I'm also curious, you know, after that first incident where you were able to help a company, you say you, you were so determined and you really wanted to um, inhabit that space and you started blogging and you blogged, you said, almost every, every day? Was it yeah, five, yeah. five days a week for wow. two solid years, and then and then I started, you know, <laughs> getting paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, listen, so I think for a lot of our listeners, maybe not necessarily within the context of crisis management or building a crisis ready culture, but for a lot of our listeners, they will probably have this question: How did you find that level of determination and grit, and also belief in your vision? Because I think it really takes deep conviction and deep belief that indeed this is a this is a space that from which I can serve and this is a space from which I can make a difference that's such an important question um and it and it's so true because I remember and I mean let's you have entrepreneurs that listen I know as part of your audience and um I, I know what that is right I I bootstrapped this and I bootstrapped everything and there were days where there were months where it was I can tell you exactly how much pasta a person can eat <laughs> on the smallest budget and you Black know beans, just, no oh yeah well, no no i'm yeah. a spaghetti girl right, so okay. you know 60 dollars two days yeah. two times a, a day for two people is a great budget on mm -hmm. food <laughs> when you don't have much money and um and i remember the seldom the few people who knew of because i was i'm a very private person 
Um, so the few people who knew that I was eating pasta uh, would look at me and say, Melissa, just go freaking get a job. Like, you know, you're being mm. ridiculous. And the answer was no. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I be, and I don't know what it was, but it was a the world needs this and I can serve and I don't, I was young and I didn't, you know, I don't have a formal education post secondary school and I don't, so I didn't have, I had to find my answers myself and built that up. Um, and, and not just that, but you know, they say you don't work a day in your life if you find the thing that lights you up. And I never did. I work even today, I work 18, you know, hour days, 12 to 18 hour days consistently, pretty much six days a week. And it's, it's my, it's my thing, right? Mm. It's my passion. It's, it doesn't feel like work. So I think it's a combination of all those things. And also a lot of luck in the sense of, I was born with a very strong sense of self. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really waver. I don't look to conform. I don't need, I don't look for external validation. Um, And I think that that has been a blessing as a gift to kind of just the person that I am that has served me through this as well. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. And I think that it's so important to find that thing that lights you up, as you say, and a lot of people struggle with that. Um, They look and they cannot find something that lights them up. So um, would you say that this was a little bit of luck also that you've kind of stumbled on this thing or when you look back, I think it's only possible when you look back, when you look back, do you see some patterns? Do you see um, how you actually were able to identify what it is that lights you up and, and commit to that? So there's two things. One, I believe that luck is who you're born to be, right? Who, who, for example, my sister is the complete opposite of me. Um, we have the same parents we have, you know, she's the closest in DNA making to mine. And yet she's the polar, polar opposite in a very, very kind of tragic, sad way. And so that's where I realized that luck is that I was born me Mm -hmm. from there. I believe that we make our luck. Um, it's what you do with that. So yes, of course I've been fortunate. I've been lucky. I've also been unfortunate and unlucky. And, you know, you talk about grit, just not, you you don't let, you don't let life take, bring you down. You also don't ride the highs too high. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in addition to that, so I remember feeling like I would say I was close with my aunt when I was younger and I would say in my early twenties or my late teens, I would say, I feel like I'm floating. I feel like I'm floating. And that was horrifying, like horrifying to me just because it was so unpleasant because I'm a very decisive person and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And so as a result, I was a dental assistant and I was a daycare teacher and I was a waitress and I was a, you know, an admin clerk at a company. And I, so I never stopped searching. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, when you, when you take action, you create motion yes. and that sends waves into the universe that comes back to you mm. and you can rule out the things that aren't meant for you. And then also being very, very aware. So when I had that aha moment where it was just this question of, Oh my God, why aren't people talking about this? Why aren't people thinking about this? Um, it's so obvious and it's so easy and it's so powerful and meaningful and important. I went with that. Like there was no waiver of, Oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. It was a, no, there's something guiding me here. There's something within me that's saying, continue this path. And then so trusting in that, and that can be, don't get me wrong. That can be profoundly scary. So, so, so scary. But one of my mottos as of recent, um, because I recently experienced fear, unlike anything I've ever experienced from business. Um, and I just decided to be scared and do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so fantastic to to hear this from you because actually uh, a couple of friends of mine and I, we also created a pact and our pact is that we're going to do at least one scary thing per day. <laughs> oh, good. For, oh, I just bought that book. Do you yeah. know that book? No. It's called Do One Thing That Scares You Every Day. No <laughs> it's way. There is a book? <laughs> yes. I just, I found it at a friend's house a few weeks ago and like immediately ordered it. Um, and it's got these phenomenal quotes in them, which oh, I thought wow. were- We had no idea. We had no idea. I'll send I you a link. 
<laughs> this is crazy. I was in New York and a friend of mine f- joined me from Boston and we literally spent four hours at the airport because we didn't have more time and just talked about stuff. And, and awesome. then she said, you know, I'm really struggling with some issues and I think there's a lot of fear and a lot of resistance and I'm wondering what, what I can do. And just in the moment that she had this idea and she said, what if we did we committed to, to doing one scary thing per day. And I have to tell you, this has been transformational, transformational. I bet. Me so and now I want to interview you. What are you doing? <laughs> so we're doing, you know, th- there's a lot of stuff that is scary to us. And when you, when you say this to someone else, I was like, well, you know, that's not so bad. It's but subjective. It's, yeah, it's subjective. And sometimes it's just putting yourself out there. Sometimes it's just writing this blog about a topic that maybe you find a little bit more difficult or complex or, or uh, being vulnerable. Sometimes it's saying yes to something that um, pushes you outside of your comfort zone. And for me, you know, very often the most scary thing that I can engage with is just sitting with the discomfort. So for example, I tend to take decisions really fast so that I don't have to weigh the pros and cons. And so often I will say either yes or no, just to get things moving and not have to sit in that space of not knowing. And so the scary thing for me is actually saying, no, I am not going to say no. I am not going to say yes. I'm going to spend a day or two and just, you know, see how I feel about this and think it through. Interesting. So, yeah. And how is that serving you? It's It's been transformational, as I said. And when I say transformational, it's, you know, it kind of changes. And I think it happens for my other two friends as well, it really changes your sense of identity. So suddenly you become the person who is braver or who's not terrified of becoming vulnerable. And of course, then it really creates a completely different impact on your environment. And so things uh, start happening that wouldn't have happened if you, if you didn't show up this way. Absolutely. Good for you. Yeah. Well, you are a good interviewer. <laughs> Um, but I think that's, you know, I, I, I really, um, think that it's good to speak about those things because you say a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs and a lot of our listeners are, um, leaders in organizations. And I think that the issue of fear is something that they all struggle with. Um, it's human. mm, It's it's huge. Yeah. So. This is this is really fascinating to learn how you decided that this is a thing that you want to do and that that you want to kind of channel or your energy into. Um, so let's go there. I I really want to learn more. But before we start talking about you know what what crisis management is, how it's different from um, building crisis readiness, let's define crisis. So what is crisis? How do you define crisis? Yes. Okay. So a crisis is a negative event or situation. Oh, let me start by saying there's a difference between an issue and a crisis and an emergency can be an issue or a crisis. So for those who kind of work in the space of emergency management, um, and it's so important today to really have a team. And I, when I say a team, I mean, every single member of the organization, I don't care if it's an organization of one, 10 or 10,000. Um, so every single member of the organization understands this because today an issue can go viral and not necessarily constitute a crisis and yet feel like a crisis. So the way in which you manage that incident is dependent largely on whether it's an issue or a crisis. So you need to, you don't want to do too much or too little or, you know, um, raise the risks or just, you don't want to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that being said, so a crisis is a negative event or situation that stops business as usual to some extent, because it requires immediate escalation straight to the top of leadership. So it requires pulling leadership out of their busy meetings, out of their busy days or waking them up because it needs their directive, their decision-making, their guidance. And, The reason being is that this negative event threatens long-term material impact on one to all of the following five things. So people, stakeholders, internal, external, does it society at large, does it matter? People, the environment, the organization's operations, its reputation and or its bottom line. Mm -hmm. Um, And the economy fits into that as well. And 
so yeah, versus an issue is also a negative event or situation. But the thing with an issue is that it doesn't stop business as usual. It does not require grabbing leadership out of their busy day because the way that I see issue management is basically your job on hyperdrive. It's the unpleasant side of your job, but it is still a part of your job and it's your job to manage it effectively so that it doesn't require escalation to leadership. And the reason being is that it doesn't threaten that long-term material impact on any one of those things. So people, Mm -hmm. the environment, operations, reputation, bottom line. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that makes me curious. How do you draw that line? How do you understand that you've reached the point or an issue has reached the point or maybe it's not an issue at all because it does threaten those things? So how do you know? By by becoming crisis ready. And I really mean that. So taking part of becoming crisis ready is doing deep dives, deep dives into the organization, deep dives into the culture. And um, so you'll never hear me use the term crisis management plan. Crisis management plan, in my opinion, is what is largely wrong with my industry. It is the you know, ancient, archaic status quo that says, we're going to create this document and this mm-hmm. document is going to sit in the binder and this binder is going to be read and it's going to be on this shelf and every you know member of this type of team. So not even every member of the team is going to have this. And in a crisis, this is going to be our default. We're going to grab the binder and it's just going to guide us through to crisis management success. But today, the reality is that things happen so quickly. Things come out of left field. You don't know who's going to be the first to detect it. You don't know how they're going to respond, if they're going to respond appropriately. You don't know if they're going to know how to escalate it, or even if they're going to detect the red flag in and of itself. And by the time you reach for that plan, you're already playing catch up, right? The story is already picking up. Stakeholder demands and expectations are already surging in. The media might already be running with it. It may have already gone viral. It may be national news or international news. And so what? that's where the crisis readiness comes in. So never crisis management plan, but instead a crisis ready program that is then embedded into the very culture of the organization so that everybody on the team understands what issue is versus what crisis is. And I will come to answer your question. They understand how to assess the material impact or the, assess the difference between the two. And they know intrinsically and they're empowered to do what's right. So do they need to escalate it? If so, to whom? Do they need to respond? If so, how do you respond to that in a way that you're going to come out of it with increased brand equity, right? So all of these things, that's very, very high level and very um, over-encompassing is that's what it means to be crisis ready. Mm. When you do take the deep dive approach, you're identifying. So every organization has a series of high risk scenarios. So most likely high impact issues, most likely high impact crises. So once you've defined issue versus crisis for your organization, and then you can say, okay, what are our, our high risk scenarios? And let's say, you know, cybersecurity is one for you, is one for your organization. It's a high risk crisis scenario. When you take the deep dive approach, when you take, so I have my my book is based off of my crisis ready model, which is the framework that I've developed over, you know, the last decade of working with organizations in almost every single sector, every single industry um, around the world. And the, the model takes you through that deep dive approach. So it's saying, okay, so cybersecurity is, one of our high risk scenarios, we are going to spend the next few months really digging into this. What, what defines a crisis? What are the attributes of crisis for this scenario? You know, is it if these certain systems are breached and are down? Is it if this certain type of data is breached or lost? Is it, um, you know, so, and then, mm-hmm. and that definition, that threshold is different for every single organization. And when you yeah. define those thresholds, then you can kick into gear and say, okay, in the event of now we know what would trigger a crisis level cybersecurity incident, now what? And then you continue to do go along that deep dive process to figure out how can you prevent the preventables today? And then what does the entire organization need to do in the event of the unpreventable occurring? Mm-hmm. Which makes me think that probably not a lot of organizations are crisis ready nowadays. Not yet, <laughs> because, but I'm working on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm really curious, you know, from your estimation, I know that it's, it's hard to say with really um, hard data, but um, what is the percentage of organizations that realize that this is what they need to do and have the right approach to um, building that crisis readiness in this way? So unfortunately, it's extremely low. Um, and it's even 
you know, the organizations, the leadership that understands the crisis management plan is higher than the crisis ready culture. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, I am working to shift that. I'm working to change that because it's in the interest. I mean, crisis at its, at its most extremes, crisis impacts people's lives, their livelihood. Uh, it impacts the environment, it impacts the economy, and it impacts an organization that has you know, built, worked for decades probably at building everything that it had. So it's significant. It's Mm. massively, massively significant. Um, So yeah, and I, you know, the, so PwC actually recently came out with a study that looked at uh, 4,000, 2,000 crises in about 4,500 companies or 4,500 companies in two, yeah, I got that backwards, Mm -hmm. 4,500 crises in 2,000 um, organizations and their, their study is phenomenal. So they collected the data, they put it together. It's available freely online at PwC. Um, and it's everything that my book talks about. It's everything that I've been talking about for years, but, you know, kind of quantified in this research and it's, in, it's really, really laid out simplistically and comprehensively. So you can really get it. And it's got a lot of, data and value. And the thing that I love about having a crisis ready culture is that it far exceeds the sole act of crisis management. So, you know, having a crisis ready culture leads to having the right, you know, putting people above process and bottom line, having a culture that lives and breathes that rewarding people for taking the right actions that focus on building trust. When you focus on building trust, that means that you are trained in validating emotion. You are trained in being empathetic and sympathetic. You are tra- so these wonderful things in in the world for society, but as well as because of the deep dive approach, you are finding blind spots and fixing them. You are um, building out you know more efficient business procedures and processes in your day to day. You are breaking down the silos that exist between departments that should not exist and creating more of a team throughout the entire culture of the organization. You're giving your entire brand, a competitive edge massively, um, because issues don't happen. And if they do, you come out of it. You know, so when mm-hmm. an issue strikes, you have one of two options, you can mismanage the issue. And it, it probably at that point in time, depending on the issue, but it probably won't escalate to crisis level right then and there, but it will chip, chip away at your trust and credibility of the brand over time versus you can well manage an issue. You can manage an issue extremely well. And what you do is you build upon that, you know, what Captain Chris Chung from Mountain View Police Department in California says is it, every well-managed issue is you're adding trust and credibility into your bank of of stakeholder goodwill Mm -hmm. and stakeholder trust. And that is monumental. That is monumental for the brand every day. It's also when the catastrophic incident comes or strikes, those people, those people who matter most to your business sit back and say, they give you the benefit of the doubt. They say, this company has never proven me wrong. They've never done wrong by me. I'm going to, I don't care what the media is saying. I don't care what's happening on social. I'm going to sit back. I trust them. They're going to come out and do the right thing. I'm going to give them that benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give them a few minutes to do that. And Mm -hmm. that grace of that moment of grace is exponential when it comes to the craziness that is involved with managing a crisis. So, and that speaks to culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. And before we talk about the benefits of having this approach in a little bit more detail, I, I'd like you to help our listeners to envision, you know, the worst case scenario. So do you have an example of a crisis situation that was handled really poorly by a company and, and maybe talk to us a little bit about what were the consequences? Well, there's so many, unfortunately. Um, the one that's kind of top of mind for me right now is Uber for years. So since 2014, in 2014, uh, 2013 or 2014, I remember there was a, it was one of the first cases of a passenger getting raped by an Uber driver and it happened in New Delhi, India. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching that because when it's the first of its kind, it's always, if it's a positive, it's great. If it's a negative, it's amplified worse. And you know, as an Uber consumer at the time that of course is relatable and and concerns you, especially as a woman who travels the world by herself. And so I'm watching that and I'm watching how Uber is going to respond. And I remember this, the founder and CEO at the time, um, 
he came out and he, you know, made some kind of statement and that the statement was fine, but then he, he completely ruined it in my opinion by saying, we are going to work with the country, uh, I'm paraphrasing, the country of India to help them with their, you know, issue with, um, with women, right? Like their, uh, their gender inequality and all of these things. And I'm sitting there going, you can't prevent your drivers from raping a woman Mm -hmm. and you're going to change and fix an entire country. Like, why don't you, (laughs) and a country that's not even your country, like let's start within. Right. And right from that point, I thought, I remember thinking this company is doomed. He is the crisis. And because there's so much to be read into a truth to be read into that type of response is just Mm -hmm. ridiculous. And so for three years, it was issue after issue after issue. Now, if you go into the studies or into the reports of the media in they, the media likes to say that in 2017, I believe that Uber hit the crisis that everything, you know, it was one thing after the other with Uber, with Uber, with Uber. But the reality was that they had a cultural crisis and culture is led from the top down and then supported bottom up. And they, their culture, their crisis was their founding CEO. They had that for years in 2017. It just all, all of the corrosion just finally erupted. And as a result, it took, so when you have a cultural crisis, you need to change leadership. So effective, successful crisis management requires simultaneous, well-performed action in real time and well-executed communication simultaneously. You cannot successfully manage a crisis with, without doing both of those things really, really well and together. And when you, so the action, when you have a cultural crisis is falls on leadership because culture is led by leadership and it took far, far, far too long for the board of Uber to finally step up and say, or realize, I don't know what, and say, he's got to go, we've got to replace him. And it was only upon doing that, that Uber even began to have a seemingly like a a semblance of a chance. Hmm. So, I mean, and that's, that's what, that's cultural crisis, right? So we could talk about, there's, it it depends on who is listening and what their high risk scenarios are, but cultural crises are one of the most challenging because they're just so deep seated. Um, but like I said earlier, every organization has high risk scenarios. So you have five to 10 scenarios that are the most likely high impact crisis scenarios that you are prone and vulnerable to. And Mm -hmm. so really it's about identifying what those are and then diving into each one of them to, again, to prevent the preventable and be ready for the unpreventable. Mm -hmm. So for those of our listeners who are not very familiar with this language yet and Mm -hmm. who are wondering now, what what do you mean by high-risk scenarios? Can you give us an example of how to, um, how to identify those and, um, what would be the basic steps to, to do that? Yeah. Great question. Okay. And I have a list in crisis ready is my book, um, building an invincible brand in an uncertain world. And I provide a list of kind of very, um, all of the high risk scenarios, you know, generally speaking, Mm -hmm. then you can pick through, but it starts with conversations. So if you get leadership together and I mean, really, you know, calling a board meeting or not a board meeting, a boardroom meeting, a meeting, um, and, Sitting, every, sitting all department heads and all you know senior management in a room together and going around the table and saying, well, what keeps you up at night? And the reason why you don't do that, in, why it's better not to do that individually is because you want a 360 view of what it is that is keeping up people up at night because the person sitting next to you isn't scared or fearful of the same thing. They're not concerned about the same thing because they have different touch points and areas of expertise within the organization. So for example, the CIO is going to say, you know, cybersecurity threats, of course, or information, you know, security. And the HR director is going to say, well, workplace violence or disgruntled employee, or so you go around the table, operations is going to say manufacturing defect or um, just, you know, everybody has a different view and a different touch point. And it's only you want to create an awareness of, oh, wow, there are significant risks. Oh, hey, if that happened, here's how we would manage that. So that would make an issue versus a crisis. What are we doing to make sure that that issue is managed now or prevented today? Um, so starting that dialogue, and it's really about creating kind of, it's this brainstorm, right? So you sit down with leadership and you conduct this conversation and have a whiteboard with you and just write down everything, every, and 
nothing is off the table. If you can think it, it can happen. Doesn't mean it's a crisis, but it means that if you can think it, it can happen. So it's worthy of thought. And so write them all down. And then when you're, what you're left with is a list of very negative events, right? So we're going to, it's a scary thing. It's a, it feels negative, but it's really, really not because when you become crisis ready, these negative events become opportunities, opportunities for connection, opportunities to showcase and live your values when you are put to the test and it matters most opportunities to build that invincibility whereby anything can, anything negative can strike your organization. And you will always, always come out on top because you do what's right and you deserve to come out on top. Um, Mm. so don't look at it from a negative sense, look at it from where you're going and that's positive. And then, so when you have that list, then it's about categorizing. So probably you're going to have, I don't know, so let's say you have two dozen things on that list, items on that list. You shouldn't have more than 10, 12 high risk scenarios. If you've got more than 10, 12 high risk scenarios, there's something that needs to be refined. And usually that's just about categorizing, you know, so cybersecurity under the umbrella of cybersecurity, you could have a malicious attack against your organization. You can have, um, you know, a a bad actor with it. Well, that would be a malicious attack. So you could have, um, human or systemic error, right? Something malfunctions or somebody clicks on a, a, creates a vulnerability or exposure Mm -hmm. for the organization unintentionally. I could keep talking. So um, I think that (laughs) that's probably a lot (laughs) to give everybody at once. Um, But to to answer your question, how do you, you know, find your high-risk scenarios? That Mm -hmm. is a really, really good exercise to conduct. Yeah, I, lo- I love that fact that you you get the whole team together and you have them discuss these issues because I think that um, it's it's important, as you say, to get the three hundred sixty perspective. And I also think that by listening to others, um, it might help some people to um, potentially cover some of their own blind spots as well. Uh, because one one of the thoughts that I had as you were speaking is, you know, what do you do with those situations that you cannot think about? And yet they are possible. Um, are there any, you know, like black swans like this um, for organizations where in spite of going through this process of identifying um, high risk situations, they haven't really foreseen that something like that would be possible? Absolutely. And then it happened. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially in this world, in today's world. So um the one, the scenario that I love to bring up when somebody asks me that question is what happened to Crock-Pot in 2018. Did you, do you remember what happened? Uh, it was right before the Super Bowl. So this is us. Are you familiar with that show? This is this us. This is us. Yeah. No. No, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't either. And apparently it's, you know, 15.6, I believe, million viewers sit down and watch wow. that show every single week. So it is one of the hottest shows on primetime television. And they aired in back in, I believe, February or late January, right before the Super Bowl 2018. They aired for two years. They had alluded to Jack Pearson, the patriarch of the family, one of the most beloved characters. They had alluded to his death. Everybody knew that he died, but didn't know how. And so this evening was the grand reveal of how he dies. And he dies by a, he, I think he turns off their generic slow cooker. So not a crock pot machine, a generic slow cooker. (laughs) And he goes to bed and the thing is old and faulty and short circuits and sets flame to the house. And he, Jack dies of smoke inhalation. Now the next day, crock pot woke up to a frenzy, a storm of longstanding generational customers threatening all on social, right? Threatening to throw out their grandparents' <laughs> crock pot machines that are, you know, a part of their Thanksgiving and Christmas family events every year and longstanding and memories and all of these wonderful things, threatening to throw them out and never mm-hmm. use the brand again. And this was on morning talk shows. It was on late night talk shows. It was being reported nationally. Um, I was back in Canada at the time. I'm Canadian and was still living in Montreal and, you know, woke up to that. So it was not just in the U.S. And so when you look at that, you could think, is that an issue or a crisis, right? It's irrational. It doesn't make any sense in the history of Crock-Pot. That's never happened. It was a fictitious television show. It was a fictional storyline. It was a generic slow cooker. It wasn't product placement. And yet here, everybody was threatening to throw out the, the throw out, you know, and not use yeah. that brand again. And a lot of organizations 
would have said something like, guys, this is ridiculous. This was, you know, a fictitious story. This has never happened. Get Mm -hmm. over it. Or leadership could have also been internally and said, this is going to die down. This is ridiculous. This is irrational. It's going to die down. Let's just write it out. But the thing is, when you look at that long-term material impact, and when you ask yourself the why as to why this was happening, so I have this formula. There's a crisis-ready formula um, that I've developed that looks at how to know if something is has a heightened probability of going negatively viral against your organization. And that is three things. So it's an emotionally compelling story, high relatability, and then a shareable file format. Now, a shareable file format is everything today, right? From videos to pictures to Mm -hmm. hashtags, you name it. So that one's kind of always existent. So is the emotional compellingness of a lot of things. A lot of emotionally compelling things get a lot of traction. But when you click in that relatability piece, things change and it moves the needle in a, in a very drastic way. And that's what happened here. So if you go back and you watch this episode, which I had never seen or heard of the show before, and I watched this five minute second, a second, um, segment while, you know, this was happening and I, it almost brought tears to my eyes. Like this is a beautiful piece of creative cinematography. Like it's, it's artistic. It's emotionally compelling. I didn't even know the character and I was sitting there going like, <laughs> right. <laughs> So think of 15 million people in their homes in a crazy busy world where people, where families barely have time to sit down and eat dinner together, somehow manage to group together every week to watch this show as a family. And they love these characters. They're dedicated, you know, emotionally attached to these characters and Jack dies. So they're in this beautiful, you know, creative, artistic way that is emotionally compelling. So they're sitting there and they're feeling and they're sad and the dog's there, the family dog is in the show and all that. And then their brains go to, oh my God, I have a crockpot machine. I don't want my family to die. And that is, so one of my crisis ready rules is you will never overcome emotion with logic. You can't. So it doesn't matter that it's irrational. It is so true for them in that moment. It doesn't matter that it's not factual to them. It's a perceived truth. And it's a perceived truth that goes to the stems to the bottom of, I need to protect the safety of the people that matter the most to me in this Mm -hmm. world. And so the long-term material impact there is sure it would die down, but what Crockpot did not want is for the next 10 years, for anybody who walks through, you know, the department store and sees their, um, their machines, they, that pang of, they may, whether they understand it or not, that pang of (gasps) right in the pit of their stomach that's associated to the death of their loved ones. And they probably won't realize it, but it will have an impact on whether they buy that because we buy based off of emotion. So that was the long-term material impact that it threatened. It's also something that out of every single high-risk scenario, nobody in a million years could have anticipated. But that's the beautiful thing about becoming crisis ready and doing the deep dive approach and building out this, integrating this into the culture of your organization is if you have 10 high risk scenarios that you are ready for, you're preventing what you can, you're ready for what you can't prevent. And an 11th strikes out of left field, the same fundamentals apply. And so your entire organization now intrinsically knows how to kick into gear and overcome that in the same beautiful way that, you know, manages it to mitigate further escalation and increases the trust and goodwill in your brand. So when you think about it, the long-term material impact that threatened Crockpot there was these long-standing, you know, for the next 10 years, customers or potential customers who are walking through the department store who see their crockpot machines, you know, sitting there and they feel whether they understand it or consciously realize it or not, but they feel this pang of uh, right in their, in the pit of their stomach or in their hearts. They don't know what it is, but we know that consumers as human beings, we tend to purchase by emotion. And so that emotion would, you know, trigger a non-purchase. And so that can be, that's a significant impact Um, If you really care about your brand, especially for a household brand that prides itself on its generational customers and all of the stories that, you know, have come through the generations of using their machines. So this was a significant incident. And yet this was a scenario that even after doing a deep dive approach, after looking at all your high risk scenarios, after everything, 
you cannot predict. So if you had 10 high risk scenarios, this is an 11th one. Nobody's going to sit there and say, well, you know, this is us can air or a television show can air and this is what can happen. And yet it happened. And so the whole thing, the whole premise of and, you know, you, you said earlier, what's the really, you wanted to talk about the value of being crisis ready. There's so many value. There's so much value. There's so much, so much positive. But when it comes down to it, having a team that is able to instinctively identify an incident and, and not make that decision to say, hey, guys, this is irrational or, hey, this is irrational. We're not going to do anything. We're going to let it die down. So identify it, assess it, and then respond in a way that quickly puts it to bed and also enables you to build, to strengthen the trust and credibility in your brand. Um, so that's a, a, I think a phenomenal example, just of something coming out of left field and having material impact or threatening to have material impact if it hadn't been responded to appro- uh, appropriately. Yeah, totally. So do you know what they did, whether they handled yes. the situation well or not? They did. So, okay. So I talked about my, crisis ready rule, uh, crisis ready formula for detecting negative virality. Um, there's also to counter that there's a formula for responding in a way, responding effectively to heightened negative emotion. And that's what they did. So first and foremost, um, Crackpot had flown so far under the radar for so long that they weren't even on Twitter when this happened in 2018. So they quickly went onto Twitter, which was smart because that's where it was unfolding primarily. Mm -hmm. And what they did was all of their responses were, they followed this formula perfectly. So the formula is you validate emotion, you relate to that emotion, and then you prove through action and words that of what you're doing and you know how you're going to make it right. So valid so if you think about it, let's break it down to just the relationships that every human has, right? You're in a in a you have a significant other or you have a sibling or you have a best friend or a cousin or an uncle, whatever. If somebody that you care about is upset and is upset with you, some kind of you know, fight. And what's one of the things that every single human wants is they want to be heard, right? So in order, if somebody's upset and they feel like you are not hearing them, you are not validating their emotion, you are never, ever going to come to deescalate that situation in a positive way. So that is first and foremost, because the common denominator across every single industry, no matter the type or size of company that you operate is human beings and human beings are, you know, wired the same way we have the same making. So validate the emotion first and foremost, once you've validated it, you then relate to that emotion. So we hear you, we understand you, what you care about matters. It also matters to us and here's why, or here's how. And then once you've done that, so one of the crisis ready rules, you can't overcome emotion with logic in order to, so emotion makes things irrational and that's not a judgment. That's just, you know, a factual statement and irrational or irrational is very, very real. Whether it's irrational or rational, it doesn't matter. It's still very, very real and can be very impactful. So in order to overcome to when somebody's emotion have taken over their the, lo- the left side of their brains, in order to get to that left side of the brain to say, guys, this is so irrational. This can never happen. And here's why. And here's the studies. And here's the proof. And here's the science. And here's the track records. In order to get to that level, you have to go in through the heart. You have to go into the heart in order for them to let you into their, you know, their logical brains. And that's exactly what Crockpot did. So they said things like on Twitter, so in, you know, 140 or so characters, they said things like, oh my goodness, our heart is broken with you. We can't believe that this is how Jack died. So they validated the emotion that Mm -hmm. this was real. It wasn't a, hey guys, this is like, Jack doesn't exist. (laughs) He's not real. (laughs) Um, And then they said, but we want you to know that your family's safety has always been our primary, our number one care and concern. And here and then, so that was validation, that was relatability. And then they came in and said, and here's the studies or here's the proof or here's the science or here's, you know, pointing to more of that logical information yeah. to back 
that that statement of we care about the safety of your family is in fact truthful. Mm -hmm. And as a result of doing that, you know, timeliness is everything in in today's world, especially when it comes to viral issues or crises. The longer you take to effectively respond to a viral issue or crisis, three things happen. One, the more trust and credibility you lose with the stakeholders. Two, the more control over the narrative you lose. And three, the more crisis response penalty, which is a term that I coined, um, you suffer. So crisis response penalty is needless, needless, so it's preventable um, consequences of a crisis on an organization as a direct result of mismanagement. And so, so all of that to say that timeliness is the timing of your communications and your actions are so, so, so essential. And they did this in the right time frame as well. Mm. That's, I, I, I love the story and I'm curious, uh, do you know whether they have come out of this crisis they stronger have. than they were? Yeah. Yes. I don't know the studies. I, I mean, I don't know the statistics. I have reached out to them numerous times. I love to interview companies um, that go through this stuff. They've never responded to my requests, unfortunately. So I can't hear from them mm-hmm. how it has, but yes, it has. Mm, that's fantastic because uh, that would be my next question. If you have any examples of companies that went through a crisis and and came out of it stronger. So that, that that's really great that... Um, this this can happen and i can see why because i think that just as you said in human relationships if you have i think a lot of people come closer together and relationships are galvanized through difficulties if they are handled well though so there is a moment whether uh, when you either break um or a relationship breaks down or it becomes stronger depending on depending on how um, people who are involved in this are going to behave and um, yeah and interact with what's happening Absolutely. so that makes total sense to me that the same thing happens at an organizational level yes so let's move on to the rapid fire questions Okay. This is a section where I ask you five questions in rapid succession and you'll aim to answer them under two minutes. Okay. Okay. Let's awesome. do this. So how do you define organizational culture? Culture is the living, breathing truth of an, of an entity, of an organization. And what would be the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? Through my lens, that would be constant issues plus ineffective issue management. That's Mm -hmm. a huge telltale. Mm -hmm. And are there any companies that you admire for their culture? And if yes, why? My, co- my clients, my clients are phenomenal. Um, why? Because they, if you, if you have buy-in from leadership to get, to become crisis ready for everything that it means to be crisis ready, it means that you are, you deserve all of the good, right? You deserve that invincibility. You put people first, you do everything right for the right reasons. And the clients, the organizations that I'm very, very blessed and honored to work with, they all have that in common. And so I'm so mm. proud of them. Wonderful. What are the books on culture or on leadership that you would recommend? Uh, Crisis Ready. It's <laughs> things that, and I don't mean that as a plug. I mean that as it is a book for leadership development. It is a book for culture. It's just through the lens of something that you'll never have, you, you won't get anywhere else. And mm. it's so, so, so powerful. Mm. And what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to build their own culture lab and with this lens of being crisis ready to cultivate a culture that that's going to help them to bring their vision to life? Um, Don't just, I would say, don't just think it or complain about it. I believe that I don't care where you sit within an organization's, you know, organizational chart and hierarchy. I believe that every human is a leader if we choose to be. And the good, the mindset, the all of the values and um, attributes of being crisis ready can be led from within a department straight through, you know, to from leadership down or just you can spread it yourself. So don't just complain about the things that you dislike about maybe the culture of your organization. Don't just think about the things that you would want to change or um, improve upon. I challenge you to start today and actually take small steps in that direction and empower yourself. Don't wait for other people to empower you. Empower Mm. yourself to make that positive change. Mm. Wonderful. 
And so finally, um, I ask all my guests to recommend someone who would be a great guest on the podcast. Um, and we're looking for people who have been successful in consciously and intentionally cultivating a culture that um, supports their company in achieving a meaningful purpose, but also thought leaders and, and people who have something interesting to say about culture. Well, the first person that comes to mind is Leanne Davy, And I know that she's been on your podcast before, yeah. but she's just phenomenal um, and such a unique lens and such, she's every, she embodies all of these wonderful mm. things. Um, Mike Ganino is, I don't know if you've had him, but he um, is the author of, uh, you know, Culture for Dummies. Yep. Um, and he's, he's really great. He does some phenomenal work as well. Yeah, I know. I know Mike personally, and he is actually going to be the next guest of the podcast. Awesome. Well, tell him yeah. I said hello. <laughs> I will. Um, wonderful. So Melissa, thank you so much for this interview. Um, the last thing is um, I, I'd like um, to encourage you or, or to invite you to maybe give some closing remarks. If there's anything that you would like to leave our listeners with, what is it? Um, when in doubt, if something happens, um, whether it's an issue, whether it's a crisis and you just feel lost or you don't know what to do because maybe you don't have that crisis ready culture yet. If you always guide yourself by, you know, answering the question is what, if I put myself in those people's shoes and those different stakeholder group shoes or who, whatever it is, what is one thing that I can do with that they would expect of me that if I do this, it will validate their emotion. It will relate to them and it will, you know, take a step in the right direction for strengthening the trust and credibility, the relationship that we've developed over time. If you allow that to be your beacon, you will, even if you make the wrong step, you'll have made it for the right reason. And that is very powerful and very meaningful and impactful. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, when you don't know what to do, when all else fails, just focus on those relationships and what matters to them and meeting what matters to them. Hmm. Wonderful. I can't think of a better way to, to end this, um, except maybe uh, telling our listeners where they can learn more about you uh, if they're interested to, um, to learn more about your work, to find your articles or books, what would be the best places for them to visit? Absolutely. Super easy. MelissaAgnes.com. That is the hub where you will find everything. Excellent. Melissa, thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks to you, Aga. This was fun. Huge pleasure. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art director, Emily Spencer. Aaron Scott, content editor. Sound producer, James Ede, be heard. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many other places where podcasts are available. If you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, The Culture Lab Insider, go to www.agabayer.com slash podcast and scroll down to the very bottom of the page. That's www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. And now it's time for the preview of the upcoming episode. My next guest is the author of Company Culture for Dummies and a true expert on storytelling and communication. It's Mike Ganino. I met Mike in New Jersey in July last year, and he completely blew my mind with his ability to pull a compelling narrative out of what seemed to be just random collection of data. Here is a short preview of our conversation where Mike talks about how we are wired to fit in, and as a result, how the environment and culture dictate how we show up at work. You know, one of the things about humans, if you go back again, studying psychology and evolutionary psychology, we're very good at figuring out how do I fit in? How do I make myself safe in this environment? And, and the way we do that is by fitting in and not standing out too much. And so if you're looking at your organization and you're saying, wow, there's a lot of things happening I don't like, 
we're, we don't, we're not innovative enough. We're not creative enough. We're not nice enough. We're not X, Y, and Z enough. It usually isn't the individual person. It is almost always the environment. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lamp. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>